Hi, my name is Luke Stevenson, and today I'm going to be walking you through how to make your very own home casting using the London Casting Company kit. Now, before I start, I would like to say that if you have any questions or if there are any problems with your kit, I want to be your personal point of contact. So feel free to shoot me a message on the company website, and I'll get back to you as soon as possible. We're a small family-run business, so it's really important to me that you have a great experience using your casting kit. And it's also really important to me that you get great casting results, which is why I've taken the time to make this highly detailed step-by-step -step guide for you to follow along with. The casting process is a fun activity and an interesting experience for anyone that's new to casting, so I really hope you enjoy making your personalized hand statue. Now, with that said, there are a couple of steps that require you to work relatively quickly, and it helps to have a good understanding of how the whole process works before getting involved. So I really do recommend that you watch this video all the way through just once before watching it again while you follow along. Now, before we start, it's important to realize that these video instructions are relevant for both the regular and the large casting kit, and we'll cover any differences as we walk through each step. It's also worth noting that if you're already part way through the casting process, you can use the quick links in the description below to jump ahead. All right, so with no further ado, let's get started. Let's take a look at the different components inside of your casting kit. I'm gonna crack open the large kit here, but if you have a regular kit, all of the components will still be the same. You'll just have less casting material and of course, a smaller casting bucket. So when you open the box, you'll find your casting bucket and that has the following components inside. An instruction booklet, protective gloves, a paintbrush, craft glue, sandpaper, a wooden sculpting tool, and then of course, our own special blends of alginate molding powder and stone casting powder. Now, to complete a successful casting, it's going to be really handy if you have other various bits of equipment too, which can typically be found around your house. They are a small plastic mixing bowl, an electronic hand mixer, a measuring jug, a stopwatch, I tend to use my smartphone timer for this, and the last two items are completely optional, but you might want to use a thermometer and that's used to measure the temperature of the water and baby oil or petroleum jelly, which can be used as a mold release. Oh, and you might also want to pop an apron on because arts and crafts can sometimes get a little bit messy. And on that note, please do be sure to do your casting in an environment that has wipe clean surfaces. Whatever you do, don't do your casting in a room with carpeted floors because the molding materials can be very difficult to remove from fabrics. Preparation, hand hold positions, do's and don'ts. Okay, it's almost time to get casting, but before we do anything, we're going to do a quick practice run to make sure that we found a handhold position we're totally happy with, and to make sure that everyone is in a comfortable position to hold that pose for a couple of minutes while the molding material sets. Start by filling your casting bucket three quarters full with water, then practice the handhold position that you'd like to cast. You probably already have a fairly good idea of what you want your finished piece to look like, but here are a few things to consider when choosing your hand pose. Tip one. This is really important to understand for any hand pose. Quite a popular hand pose for individuals to do is the American Sign Language I Love You pose. But do be aware that this handhold position can cause problems during the casting process. Notice how the middle finger and the ring finger are bent more than 90 degrees. And as a result, when you put that hand into the bucket, those fingers will be pointing upwards. Imagine for me, if you will, pouring a load of cement around your hands in this position. When the cement sets and you remove your hand, the cross section of the cavity it leaves behind will look something like this. Now imagine pouring water into this space with the intention of completely filling the whole cavity with water. The water would begin filling up the empty space like this, but when it gets to this point here, a big pocket of air will get trapped up in the fingertip section because the air has no escape route. So while the water continues to fill up the main section of the cavity, it'll never actually reach the fingertip area up here. Well, it's exactly the same when you're casting. Only instead of using cement, we're using alginate, and instead of using water, we'll be filling up the cavity with liquid stone. So if you want to make a hand gesture like this, make sure that these two fingers are touching the palm of your hand so that you provide an escape route for the air that might otherwise get trapped. And that way, you get to keep your fingertips. So tip number one, where possible, choose a hand position where all of your fingers are pointing downwards, or if you'd like to hold your hands like this, just ensure that your fingertips are touching the rest of your hand and that'll give any trapped air an escape route. Tip two, remember that your hands are very expressive. When your hand is tense like this, it conveys stress. So do keep a relaxed pose because the relaxed position conveys calm and beauty. Tip three, 
Think about what your handhold will look like when it's sitting on your mantelpiece. For example, a thumbs up symbol will actually look more like a hitchhiker symbol when the casting is taken out of the mold. Tip 4. Do feel free to hold objects in your hand when casting. Perhaps you might want to create a candle holder, a flower vase stand, or you might wish to hold items that mean something special to you. Any non-porous item should work fairly well for this, but whatever you do, please don't use anything porous, because the alginate will stick to it and your special item may be ruined. If you do use an object and you want that object to be removable from the casting grip, be sure to hold the item below the midline. If you don't, the fingers on your plaster statue are going to lock the item in and they aren't going to bend to release that item. So go ahead, practice a few different handholds until you've found something you're happy with and once you have, it's time to stand around the bucket, resume the handhold position and dunk your hands into the water together. Lower your hands all the way into the bucket until you hit the bottom and then pull back up about one centimeter, ensuring that no part or any of your hands or arms are in contact with the bucket as that can affect your casting results. Now, practice staying still in that position for one minute. Doing that will help to ensure that everyone is standing in a comfortable position when it comes to creating the real casting. When you're confident about your hand position and you know you're standing in a good position, go ahead and dispose of that water and let's move on to the next step, making the mold. All right, here comes the fun bit. We're ready to make our mold. So to start with, we need to measure out the right amount of water to be mixed with your alginate powder. If you're using a regular size kit, you need to measure out 2,280 mils of water. And for large kits, you'll need to measure out 5,400 mils of water. The water should be less than 21 degrees Celsius or 70 degrees Fahrenheit. If the water is warmer than that, the alginate will set too quickly and won't give you enough working time. On the other hand, if you use colder water, it will take longer for the alginate mixture to set, which is obviously a much better scenario than having it set too quickly. So if you don't have a thermometer, please err on the side of caution by using water that physically feels cold to the touch, because that's likely to be lower than the maximum recommended temperature of 21 degrees Celsius or 70 degrees Fahrenheit. Once you've measured out the correct amount of water, you can add it to the casting bucket. Now, before we touch the alginate, there are a couple of things you need to do. The first is optional, and that's to either apply petroleum jelly or baby oil to your hands. Oil acts as a nice mold release, allowing you to slip your hands out of the mold slightly more easily once the mold is set. But if you don't have oil, don't worry. It's really easy to get your hand out of the mold without using it, so it really isn't essential. If you do use oil or petroleum jelly, just make sure that you apply it very lightly because any big clumps will affect the quality of your casting. Now it's time to get your stopwatch out because the next step is a timed activity. But before you start the timer, let's take a quick look at what you need to achieve in this two minute window. Here's a quick summary. You're going to start the stopwatch, pour all of the alginate powder into the water, mix it with your electronic mixer, Smother your hands in pink goo, then resume your handhold position and dunk your hands. That's what you need to achieve within your two minute window. Okay, so if you have a regular kit, you'll be tipping about 570 grams of alginate into the water. And if you have a large kit, you'll be using 1350 grams. That's all of the alginate that's included in your kit. All right, let's go ahead and do it. I'll start the timer and pour the alginate into the water, mixing it as I go. Now, some people might try to mix the alginate powder into the water using a spatula. I really would recommend against doing this because you don't have a lot of time to mix the powder into the water and it's not a very good way of mixing this particular material. So do use the electronic mixer as instructed. At about one minute, 30 seconds, I take the mixer out. We dunk our hands into the pink mixture, pull them back out again, Use our other hands to rub the mixture into the back and front of the hand, in around the rings and underneath the fingernails. That'll help to remove some of the micro air bubbles that form on the surface of your skin and it'll also help us get a more detailed casting result. Once you've done that, you're going to resume the handhold position and dunk your hands just like you did in the practice round with water. Lower your hands right down until you hit the bottom of the bucket, then raise them up slightly so that no part of your hands or arms are in contact with the bucket. And that's it, you've completed all of the timed activities within the two minute window. Now all you have to do is stay as still as possible for the next five to six minutes while the mixture solidifies into a rubbery mold. Be sure that your hands don't start to float by watching the line on your wrists. Try and keep them at the same depth in the alginate at all times. Removing your hands and preparing the mold. 
All right, now we're going to remove our hands from the mold, starting with the smallest person first. So what you need to do is very gently gyrate your wrist and wiggle your fingers down below until the air seal is broken. Now, if you're wearing any rings, do make sure that they come unstuck from the alginate before you begin to pull your arm out nice and slowly. If you are wearing a ring, it's a good idea to dip that finger downwards like this as you pull your hand out of the mold. Do also be careful not to scratch the mold with any long fingernails. Take it in turns, one at a time, until all hands are removed from the rubbery mold. Excellent, you've now got a highly detailed mold and you're almost ready to start the stone casting process. But before you do, let's clean this mold up to ensure that we get the best results possible. The first thing I recommend doing is removing these flappy bits of alginate from the top of the mold. Once you've gotten rid of the big bits of alginate here, I recommend swilling some cold water around inside of the mold to help remove any loose fragments of alginate that might have fallen into the mold. Do this a few times to make sure that you've removed all of the debris from inside of the mold. And on the final time, make sure that you get as much of the water out of the mold as possible, because we don't want any mini pools of water to affect your casting results. If you'd like to, you can allow the mold to dry for a few minutes, but please move on to the next step within 30 minutes, as the alginate material may begin to shrink if it's allowed to dry for too long. Making the casting. Now that we have our mold prepared, cleaned and dried, it's time to make the liquid stone to pour into the mold. First things first, let's pop on those protective gloves because the liquid stone heats up as it dries. Once you've got your gloves on, we're going to measure the water you need for mixing the stone powder. If you have a regular kit, you need to measure out 750 mils of water, and if you have a large kit, you'll need 1,175 mils of water. Pour your water into your plastic mixing bowl and get your timer out again, because you have five minutes to perform the next couple of actions, which is plenty of time to do this at a nice relaxed pace. So once you've started your timer, you're going to pour all of the stone powder into the water, and then you're going to let that powder soak for roughly 60 seconds. After that 60 seconds is up, you need to stir the powder into the water using your gloved hands. Keep stirring until all of the lumps in the powder are gone, which should only take a couple of minutes more. And after that two minutes is up, the liquid stone should have turned into a smooth paste with a thin, paint-like consistency. Now we're going to start pouring the liquid stone into the mold, but we're going to do that using a very specific method. So grab your molding bucket and tip it sideways at about a 45 degree angle. The angle doesn't have to be precise, but in many ways, the steeper you can make the angle, the better. Now, while it's tipped in this position, you want to slowly pour the stone mixture into the mold whilst also rotating the bucket in a circular motion, like this. You're going to do that until the cavity is about 25% full. Rolling the bucket in this motion will help to reduce the likeliness of any small air pockets from becoming trapped and chopping off your fingertips, like we discussed earlier. Now, once it's about 25% full, grab the bucket by the sides and bang it lightly on the work surface. Then give it a few taps all the way around the edge of the bucket to help remove those really small air bubbles. And you're going to repeat the last couple of steps over and over until the mold is full. So tilt the bucket, fill the mold whilst rotating the bucket, then give it a few light taps on the work surface and on the side of the bucket with your hand. Now, when you're coming up to the last round of filling, you need to make sure that you don't overfill the mold. So I typically fill up the mold to the top of the cavity and no further. Okay, now that the mold is full up, I recommend tapping the side of the bucket for the next five to 10 minutes and doing that will help you get an even better final result because it will help to dislodge some of those smaller air bubbles from the stone mixture. Even during this short amount of time, you'll probably notice the stone beginning to harden. After five to 10 minutes of tapping, we're gonna leave the stone casting alone for the next two or three hours. But do be sure not to wait any longer than four hours because we want to remove the stone from that dark, damp environment and allow the casting to breathe while it dries. Just as a side note, you might have excess plaster at this point. If that is the case, please don't pour it down your kitchen sink because you don't want to risk clogging up your pipe work. Just let it solidify in the plastic container and it will soon turn into a solid block that's easy to remove and to dispose of. The same goes for washing your items down. Please use an outside tap or do it in a wash bucket so that you can dispose of the dirty water elsewhere rather than down your pipes. If you give your protective gloves a quick rinse now, it means that you can use them for a later step. Okay, it's been about three hours since we poured the stone mixture into the mold, and now it's time for the big reveal. Exciting times. So grab your bucket, carefully turn it upside down, gently press against the sides of the bucket until the suction breaks and the mold should come out of the bucket, like so. Now sometimes this is easy and sometimes it's just not. It's luck of the draw. If you're struggling to remove the casting and the mold from the bucket, there are a couple of things that you can try. 
The first thing I recommend is using some kind of tool to poke a good size hole in the bottom of the bucket. Now if you are going to do this, please be sure to make the hole over towards the side of the bucket and do be sure not to poke into the alginate too far because you don't want to bump into the stone casting with your tool. Please also try to be really careful not to slip and hurt yourself while doing this. Once you've made the hole, you can either grab a straw, as I'm doing here, or just wrap your lips around that hole and gently blow. That'll encourage the mould to come out. If you don't want to use this method, or it simply isn't working for you, it's time to perform some simple archaeology by digging that casting out of the mould from the top. Once you've managed to remove the mould from the bucket, mine happened to come out first time, you can start gently removing the alginate in small chunks with your fingers like this. Be sure to remove only small chunks at a time because you don't want to end up breaking a finger off or taking out any of the finer details like the gemstone on an engagement ring. You can pop the alginate straight into the trash since it isn't reusable. You should be able to repeat this process until you're left with just the smaller bits of alginates that are stuck in the nooks and crannies and we'll deal with those in just a second. Alright, so you've been able to reveal the vast majority of your masterpiece now. How's it look? I hope you're really happy with it so far. Now, you'll notice that I haven't removed all of the alginate just yet, and to do that, I use the wooden tool included inside of your kit. Before I do that, I'm going to wash my hands with soap to make sure that I've got really clean fingers, because I'm now going to be handling the casting, and I don't want to stain it with any dirty marks or oily skin. In fact, if you've still got your protective gloves from earlier on in the process, you can give them a quick clean and pop those back on if you'd like. So you'll notice that the wooden tool that is provided in your kit has two ends, a pointed end and a chamfered end. And I'm going to use the pointed end to dig out the small remaining bits of alginate because we're going to use the chamfered end for something else in just a second. So here we go, there's no real technique to this, just get in there and dig those little bits out. Now if there's any bits that you can't get out right now, you can leave them in there for the time being and over time they will shrivel up, shrink and they should be easier to remove at a later date. And now we're going to do a quick clean up job to remove any minor imperfections. So depending on how your cast came out, you might see tiny little bobbles on the surface of your casting, and they're caused by the micro air bubbles that cover your skin. So to remove those mini air bubbles, I'm going to use the chamfered end of the wooden tool and simply smooth over that area of the stone until it's no longer visible. Okay, so nice and simple, just like that. Once we're done with the cleanup job, it's time to set your casting out in a warm, bright environment to dry. I recommend propping the base up on something to allow the air to move all the way around and underneath the casting, and that way the casting can dry out the stone at an even rate. We're going to leave this to dry for at least one week, maybe even two weeks, before we make the finishing touches. So now it's ready to make the finishing touches to your casting. Here's a different casting I made earlier. Included in the kit was some sandpaper, and I'm going to use this to tidy up the base of the casting. Now this is completely optional. Some people prefer the rustic look of a natural base, but my preference is to flatten out the base and to bevel the edges of the casting ever so slightly. So I'm in a well-ventilated area, and I'm going to take my sandpaper and lightly bevel the bottom corner of the stone casting. Be really careful as you do this, because any thin flakes of plaster will be very brittle, and if they break off, they can actually take a larger chunk of stone than you might expect. Let me show you exactly what that means by taking a chink out of the side here. Now, if that does happen to you, just make this bevel a little bit larger and work that chunk out of there so that the casting is smooth all the way around. Now I'm going to lay the base flat onto the sandpaper and gently move the casting back and forth in a slight circular motion, allowing the weight of the casting to do all the work for me, so I'm not pressing downwards on the casting at all. Once you've done that for a while, the base becomes nice and smooth. I'm really happy with how that base looks now, so it's time to move on to the final step of sealing the casting. The reason we seal the cast is to protect it from the elements. There is a lot of moisture in the air and that moisture can be absorbed by an unsealed casting. There are a couple of different methods for sealing your casting. The first method is to use the craft glue included in your casting kit. The alternative is to use paint and if you did want to paint it, head over to our website for more details on that. Before we mix the glue, go ahead and blow off any dust and debris around the casting. You can also use the included paintbrush to sweep off any powdery dust. Now grab a small dish and mix one part craft glue to approximately four parts water. Measurements don't have to be too specific for this, but what you're looking for is something like this consistency here. So we're going to go ahead and paint this mixture onto the casting, being sure to get into all of the small nooks and crannies, and once the casting is dry it will have a nice smooth texture to it, it will look just as beautiful as before, and it will be more protected from the elements. Alright, I'm going to let that dry, and I'll come back to it in a few hours time. 
Excellent, that glue is now fully dry and I can pick up the casting with my bare hands without worrying that I'm going to make it dirty. Well guys, that's almost it. I just want to take a quick minute to personally thank you for purchasing the London Casting Company hand casting kit. And I really hope you love your casting results. And if I could just ask one favour from you, it would just be to leave me a product review from wherever you bought this kit. As I said at the start of the video, my name is Luke Stevenson and I want to be your personal point of contact if you have any problems with your kit or if you have any questions about your kit. Guys, I hope you've really enjoyed this process. Thank you so much for buying our kit and thank you so much for watching.